I have a little league coach. I have, uh, you know, right. I have seven, seven and eight year old uh, boys, and so there's a lot of like children's athletics. Filled. My bandwidth yeah. is filled with sort of rock and roll, radical politics, and base and children's yeah. baseball. Hi, I'm Tom from Enemy, and we're here with Tom Morello. So, how's it going, man? Going well. Nice to see you. Welcome to London Thank again. You. Thank you. Pleasure. I'd like to kind of take you back to December last year, mm -hmm. when uh, you kind of you were in the headlines because someone uh, commented on your Instagram, claiming that you were, uh, I believe the word was, another musician who thinks they know things about politics now. Right. And you quite, quite expertly <laughs> kind of told them what for. I mean. Yeah. How, I, I, how I, does, I believe I pointed out that, that you, one did not need to be an honors graduate in political science from Harvard University in order to understand that Trump was a dick. Yeah. But I do happen to be an honors graduate in political <laughs> science from Harvard University, so I can confirm that Trump is a dick. With, official, my, expert, with my expert opinion, yeah, yeah. The yeah. official verdict is yeah, yeah, Trump yeah, is yeah, a dick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> and obviously, I mean, that question has been bounded about quite a lot recently, the whole idea of musicians should stick to being musicians. Sure, I mean, sure. what's your... I mean, well, I mean, I don't know that that's suggested in, in, in any other... First of all, anyone who suggests that you just play guitar or stay out of politics, the reason they're doing it is because they disagree with your politics. Now, when the actor Ronald Reagan or Schwarzenegger, you know, who were conservative politicians, ran for office, they were touted by these same people uh, uh, for their charisma and how they used their uh, art artistic skills to sort of woo the people. Um, so I'll, I also think, you know, in the, in the United States we have a thing called the First Amendment and you don't uh, give the your right of free speech away when you pick up a guitar. So I just think it's, yeah. it's people who have sour grapes because they're, you know, one of the things when you, when you are you do have some sort of platform. You have a microphone that they don't have, and so on social media they try to even the odds by uh, telling yeah. you to shut up. <laughs> One thing I will not be doing is shutting up anytime soon. So, yeah. And yeah, I mean, obviously, what kind of booted that all off was was your your fuck Trump guitar. Sure, 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 sure. I mean, sure, sure. we're two months, uh, two years, sorry, almost into that presidency I'm sorry now. As well. yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah I mean, yeah, yeah. how do you? Look on, look upon it now. I guess compared yeah, to yeah. Well, I think that it's it's important. While Trump is an abomination, I think it's it's important not to look at him independent of the system that produced him. And it was years of these neoliberal policies that were supported by Clinton and Bush and Obama and the other Bush that caused. Uh, the working class to really suffer, and they sent their kids overseas to fight in ridiculous, you know, Im amoral wars. Um, they found that they had less future. For I come from I come from Trump country, like my, the small town in Illinois where I come from. Democrats don't even run. Yeah. Um, and you know, like the options open to people are: you join the army, you work at Walmart, uh, you sell meth. Um, and they looked at the, a broken system, and Trump provided some of the easiest answers, which are, it's the Mexicans' fault, it's the Muslims' fault, uh, and that sort of racist way of dividing and conquering the working class has had success before, and it certainly had success, success with this demagogue. Do you see there any being like a kind of solution to this, or yeah. do you think it just has well, to say that, play going, out? Going back to your first question, like it's one more reason why people should not be silent in their vocations, yeah. is, that, is that there's this kind of void of, there's the, the uh, standard operating procedure of the parties, of the newspapers, of the talking heads and the media, and then there's this wild card Trump who, you know, is raging against the machine in, in a way that is attractive simply because it stands in stark contrast to this spoon-fed uh, 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 version of history and society that you get. It's very important if you have an, an outsider view that differs from that, like I do, I think it's crucially important whether you're a journalist, whether you're a cameraman, whether you're wh whatever your occupation is, to not leave your convictions behind in your vocation and to enter that debate. We all have a megaphone of different sizes to speak up. Do you think that is that is kind of the only way kind of out of these things and that eventually a voice will come forward that yeah. can stand well, I don't think it's it. going to be one voice. I'm, I'm not sort of waiting for a messiah. The way that, the way that change has, has you know, happened in, in my country, progressive, radical, or even revolutionary change, it's always come from below. Always come from below. And, you know, it's, you know, whether it was, you know, women getting the right to vote, or desegregating lunch counters, or even globally, whether it was the dismantlement of the Berlin Wall or the end of apartheid, those things happened because people no different from the people watching this or reading this, people who had no more power, no more courage, no more intellect than you out there, stood up in their time to change the world. That's how the world changes. I mean, in the Sleep Now in the Fire video, 
Sure. You're quite famously... Pre yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, you kind of predicted this in yeah, a way. Yeah, well, Michael, we I have mean, to give Michael Moore some credit for that, but we jokingly, in the 1999 Rage Against the Machine video for Sleep Now in the Fire, had a placard that said, Trump for pre Trump 2000 for president, and so I apologize <laughs> that our Nostradamus uh, skills were, were yeah. more I mean, did you, accurate than I... Did you remember that when all this started kicking off? Or was it no, only when somebody people... reminded me on Twitter or something, and yeah. it came back around. And I, I had forgotten. I just couldn't believe it. I'm like, you just wow. kind of go, oh, yeah, gosh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It made me want to sort of parse through other videos to see what other natural disasters we might have uh, foreseen. Obviously, you still keep up to date with, with your kind of political sure. slide, yeah. side. I mean, what other things that are kind of engaging you now, do you think? Mm. Well, I'm also an avid Little League coach. I have, uh, you right. know, I have seven, seven and eight-year-old uh, boys, and so there's a lot of like children's athletics. <laughs> My bandwidth yeah. is filled with sort of rock and roll, radical politics, and base and children's yeah. baseball. <laughs> nice to have a little break every day. There's not much. Really, uh, I don't know that it's a break. That's one of the probably the most stressful of the three. <laughs> yeah, there's a, a lot riding. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and you sent a kind of cease and desist letter to Nigel Farage earlier this sure. year. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of interpolating. Interpolating your name some, somewhat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that he was, you know, sort of uh, springboarding off the, you know, the off of Rage Against the Machine in a, you know, a, I don't know, semi-conscious way to sort of boost his own standing, perhaps, perhaps among the youth, and that's just not going to fly. I mean, we're gonna, certainly not going to uh, stand back and let someone like that get away with, with uh, in the same way like Trump. I mean, the, the, the reason why we formed the band Prophets of Rage was I saw on CNN it said, D Donald Trump rages against the machine. Like, you can't have that. Yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. don't get that. And if you do try to usurp it, whether it's unintentionally like Trump or intentionally like, like him, um, we have to speak out about it. What voices do you think are coming out that kind of stand against this ideal? I don't know. I mean, the, the voices that I... I yeah. For me, it's like voices in, in the arts. Like I spend a lot of time with Chuck D, for example. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, who's talking about sort of a mega megaphone of truth. Um, you know, and, and I just think that the, like my moral compass has always been to you know to always stand up for the underdog, always stand up for the poor, always stand up for the oppressed, always to without uh, batting an eye. You know, stand up for those who are on you know the right side of history and who sort of deserve better. We have, with the incredible amount of like riches and resources this planet has, the fact that we have such extreme poverty is is a crime. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we are hurtling towards, uh, we, you know, with, with my country in particular, with a foot on the gas pedal towards environmental disaster. Like racism is a problem, economic uh, inequality is a problem, n not enough rock and roll on the radio is a problem. But all those pro <laughs> all those problems are will become insignificant. You know, when the oceans rise in a way that destroy, that threatens organized human activity. And uh, that, I think, is really like the, the, the measure of our time. Yeah. I mean, last time you were here, I believe, was um, with Prophets of Rage yep. last year, headlining yep. Brixton. Yep. And that came like the day after a pretty huge general election here, mm. in which Jeremy Corbyn made some like huge gains. And mm. he was, again, seen as a kind of voice of the people. Yep. Um, do you still see that at your shows? Do you still feel like they're a kind of political entity themselves? Absolutely, and they've they've never not been, and they're intentionally so. And it, it's a it's a gathering of the tribes, and it's a you know there's something in rock and roll music or in hip hop or anything that combines uh, a beat on the two and the four and a and a and a couplet that feels like the truth, and a large room full of people. There's a lot of there's always been a lot of potential there, uh, and not just sort of sort of not just in the tribal celebration, but in the gathering of community to figure out what it is we're going to do. So, with your new solo material, I mean, what to start with? What made you want to kind of break away from the solo stuff you've done yeah. under the Night Watchman? Yeah, and into kind of your own name. I suppose. Yeah. Well, this is this is the my oh my gosh, it's like. 16th, 17th record that mm. I've made, uh, the Atlas Underground record, and I wanted, a, a, you know, I've always tried to push myself as both a guitar player and as an artist, and didn't want to make the same records that I had, uh, another record like I had made before, and I wanted to, cr I've done a lot of, of collaborative work over the course of, you know, d d decades, but never something like this, where I, I it, this is a sonic conspiracy, is how I look at it, and I wanted to curate a record that aimed to create a new alloy of rock and roll, which has my Marshall Stack fury mixed with huge EDM drops in a way that is, that I, I, there, I've never, there's no records that go for it in the way that I went for it on this record. And, and, and also, the record in itself, 
the um, participants in the record, I think it speaks volumes. It is artists of diverse genres, diverse ages, diverse ethnicities, and diverse genders who have come together in solidarity to make a very cohesive, harmonious, and hopefully powerful statement. And that in itself is a statement, that in these divisive times, that a diverse group like this can get together to make a, a solid piece of rock and roll. Yeah, I mean, how did you kind of collect together all these mm. all these people from all these different yeah, backgrounds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, so some are some are longtime friends. You know, Marcus Mumford and I have you know had a few nights tearing up the East Village uh, in Manhattan, and Wu Tang Clan and I go back to you know they toured with Rage Against the Machine in 1997. But uh, others were I. Um, the, what began this this journey was I've always I've always hated EDM music, or my, what my understanding was of EDM music, which was Italian taxi cab music, is how I kind of, kind right. of viewed it, or else my it, my interpretation of what's going on on an Ibiza dance floor, which I want to just attack. Yeah. Uh, um, and then someone turned me on to Knife Party and Bass Nectar and Skrillex, who had a very, all of whom are big Rage Against the Machine fans, coincidentally. Mm. Um, and I heard in their music the same heaviness and the same tension and release of the rock and roll that I like best. And I thought, you know, like the, the, the light bulb went on, I said, what if we replace half to two thirds of your synthesizers with my electric guitar? But, but so the idea would be like, if my electric guitar were the Ansel Adams black and white sharp photograph, I want to take that hand that to you and you give me back the shattered Picasso version of it. You know, yeah. like like it's you can recognize the image, but in a in a completely different way of of seeing it. And that's how the Atlas Underground began. What were your kind of, I guess, favorite collaborations? Were there any that were like more of a challenge? I suppose uh, that were, every track. Yeah, every, yeah, every track came together person. very, very differently. I mean, like the, for example, the Gary Clark Jr. song, we, you know, did had, had a, a you know, three-hour blues jam at the studio at my house. And then that song turned out to be this kind of roaring EDM metal locomotive that was entirely bore little relation to the, the jam that was actually happening in the yeah. room. Uh, with Knife Party, I sent them a um, like a like a riff tape of ten hot riffs and a bunch of crazy guitar noises, and said, "Just plug that into your system, right. and let's see what comes back." Uh, other songs like you know Vic Mensa, we wrote that song you know, in the room together, uh, and he's amazing. He just you know, he doesn't write write anything down. He just like com composed it in his head and went in the vocal booth and right. laid it down. Like, and then Marcus Mumford and I, we you know we're rock dads, so he would uh, put his kids to bed over here, and I'd you know be dropping my kids off school in Los Angeles, and we'd come and we'd Skype you know with our robes with acoustic guitars, <laughs> uh, writing a song that way that then, um, you know, sort of became the, the anthemic ode that it is now. So a lot of different ways of making them. Right yeah, now. for sure. Yeah. And I mean, like you kind of touched on, I guess, the ideas of like dance music and rock yeah. and roll are kind of seen as like polar opposites sometimes. Exactly. It's exactly. nice for you to yeah, kind of merge them together. Absolutely. In the same way, in the same way that hip hop and rock and roll were looked as as opposing um, entities, you know, when the first Rage record came out, you know, and the idea is this is in some ways it's sort of a 2.0 of that of like trying to create a new genre, you know, and and that while you know rock and EDM have overlapped in the past, like no one's gone for it like this in a way that uh, you know as a guitar player I've been uh, influenced by dance music and it was Crystal Method and, and Prodigy back in the day that I would listen to those textures uh, and try to approximate them on the electric guitar and and then also in my R2D2 noise making I've you know drawn from a lot of non-traditional rock and roll sources so the idea of okay let's match that with some of these huge drops you know felt like a, a natural progression I suppose something that will have like drawn a lot of people to yourself as a guitarist is like you say that kind of the way that you approached a guitar back then is that some is that still the way that you approach it now as yeah, like a kind of yeah. electronic tool yeah exactly exactly and it's a you know it's a um, a collaborative partner on the one hand and so we so there's a there's an ongoing Exchange and relationship, and, and on, on this record, I wanted to, I, I wanted there to be huge riffs, but I wanted you to hear them in a very, very different way. Um, I wanted there to be 
crazy solos, but not in sort of a traditional, you know, foot on the monitor shredding way. Not that there's anything wrong with that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the next time. It'll, it'll be old thrash and if you come to the show, if you come to the show tonight, there'll be plenty of that. There'll be plenty of that. Uh, but uh, a number of times in my career, I've, I've, I've aimed to reinvent what it is that I do on the electric guitar, and this is no different. And obviously, I mean, you touched on Marcus Mumford there. I mean, there's been some chat around a photo of them with Jordan Peterson recently. Oh, yeah. And they said, um, over the weekend, they said, you know, just because we hang out with these people doesn't mean that we politically agree with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that a stance that you take? Or? Oh, sir. I mean, certainly. I, there, again, there's no, I have friends across the political spectrum. I think it's, I think that's sort of, uh, um, you know, some people who's, who's, Political opinions uh, bump against those that I disdain are also like lifelong friends, and there's no reason to. Uh, but you know, on the, on the other hand, there, I think it's important to, to to recognize you know people who are really like sort of the. I don't need to be uniting with diehard racists. You know, that's yeah, not, yeah. they deserve more smashing than uniting. <laughs> you you firmly on the. Uh the stance of punch a Nazi then, because that was kidding? another I mean, my gosh, I mean, like, thing. We, the fact that that's a controversial thing is the, one of the most insane, like, is so, is so crazy to me. I think it was, maybe it was Bill Maher and I went around about that, and I was like, <laughs> yeah. Well, if, it, if it comes to it where we can't punch Nazis, then who can we punch? Really? <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, this isn't your first time kind of collaborating with kind of very high-profile people. I mean, yeah. probably most notably, certainly for me, was your time in the East Street Band. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, sure. that's how... A, how did that come about? And yeah. B, kind of, how mad is that joining yeah. someone like Bruce Springsteen on tour? <laughs> it's mad. It's way mad. Is how mad it is. Um, with uh, Bruce, and I'd known Bruce for about eight years before we ever collaborated together. His sister Pam Springsteen is a rock photographer, so I met. We met through her, and uh, I'm a huge fan. Like, it's, I'm not a casual fan. Like Bruce Springsteen is. You know, I have very. There are very few friends that I have that I subscribe to multiple fanzines about them, right. and that I once sort of you know ran down Sunset Boulevard trying to kiss their heads. So that's like <laughs> so it's a different kind of. <laughs> it's hard to sort of be peers with Bruce Springsteen, but um, but over the course of I mean, when we first really became acquainted was Rage Against the Machine covered uh, the Ghost of Tom Joad, um, kind of a Sabbath esque version of that, and then the next time I saw Bruce, we had more to talk about, and. Uh, we played together for the first time in 2008, 10 years ago, and it was, uh, we played a hybrid version of Ghost of Tom Joad. It was a little bit of his spooky acoustic folk ballad and a good deal of sort of the rage, you know, uh, electrified version, and, um, and it was pretty magical that night. And since we played together over the course of the next, you know, six years uh, on and off, and it was pretty awesome to be able to. You know, I would. I've never been. I've never been trying to be in anybody's band. Like I've always yeah. liked to have my hand on the wheel. But if there's anybody's band I would be in, it would be Bruce Springsteen. And I really loved watching his commitment to awesomeness on a daily basis. Yeah. yeah. Was it nice to kind of, I guess, be able to bring your own stuff to his material if you're such a fan as well. Yeah, such a fan. I mean, I, mean, I look at like, the East Street Band doesn't need me. Like, they've, been, they've, <laughs> they've been real great for, you know, four decades before I before I ever I ever played with them. But it's just an honor to be, you know, to ask to be a part of it and to, you know, I would throw in suggestions from time to time about why don't we cover an ACDC song or, uh, uh, and I always loved it when Bruce would just give me the nod to blow the roof off the place too. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, it's not like you turned up trying to kind of I'll Steve Van Zandt from no the heavens, no heavens, in. no heavens. I have a tremendous amount of respect for the, for the <laughs> whole thing there. I mean, always consider myself an, an ally of the E Street Band. They are the E Street Band, and I was, I was fortunate to be an ally for some. Yeah, of and obviously um, another kind of collaborator of yours was Chris Cornell sure, in sure. Audio Slave. I sure. mean, obviously what happened was a tragedy. I mean, how do you kind of look back on your time with him? I yeah, yeah. Um, well, I look back on my time with him with great fondness, and you know, I will not be. I'm still reeling over his passing. It's really horrible, <laughs> and uh, it's not. It's a huge personal loss and a huge loss to music. He's one of the greatest rock singers and melody creators and songwriters of all time. So, um, I was just glad that we, uh, you know, when Audio Slave broke up, we took some time apart, and I got to play with him two times, you know, before he passed, which was really wonderful. A, a small benefit show to raise the minimum wage in uh, in Seattle where we played together. And then he we did three Audio Slave songs at the anti-inaugural ball on the night of Trump's inauguration in LA. And that was just awesome to, you know, to be in his rock god presence. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. His passing has strong quite a lot on 
quite a lot of light on kind of mental health issues. Sure, and stuff. sure, yeah. Do you think that that kind of that conversation is opening up somewhat? Yeah, slightly? yeah. Well, it's a heavy price to pay to open that conversation. Course, but yeah, yeah, there's been a, a uh, you know a number of sort of high-profile instances of uh, where issues of you know suicide, depression, and addiction uh, have come forward and. Um, if there can be, there, there can be no silver lining to Christmas panels, like, but if there can be any way to help make it uh, uh, m more meaningful is if, if uh, others can uh, seek help who, um, whether they're struggling with depression or addiction, that would be, that would cer certainly be uh, a good thing towards his legacy. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'd like to talk about Prophets of Rage for a bit. Sure. I mean, that's is that kind of your main sort of band <laughs> as, at yeah. the moment? I suppose yeah, no, I'm, I'm, it's very hard to pick what yeah, your main is, thing it, is. It, like. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. But uh, no, it is. Uh, uh, we're in the midst of making a Prophets of Rage record and uh, have you know recorded some songs. More more will be recorded, but it's a. Uh, you know that band started as kind of like an idea to go on one tour for one summer, to sort of inject a different voice into the political discourse, or different rock and roll slash hip hop voice in the political discourse during the 2016 election. We found we love playing together. And yeah. so it's an ongoing entity and there's uh, no end in sight and we love it and we'll hopefully be back uh, next summer here. Yeah, is it very much kind of taking it as it comes? Like you said, it was supposed to be just a kind of... Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I wouldn't say it's taking it Now it's a real band and we're all committed to and everybody loves doing it. And you know, like. Chuck is the busiest man in show business, and be re Cypress Hill has a great new record out called Elephants on Acid, and I've, I've got this, and uh, um, so it's in that way, it's a, uh, it's a, it's it's great to be able to have these. I won't even say sort of satellite because like the Alice Underground is what I'm focused on now, and I'll be touring that in 2019 as well. But to be able to have a home in Province of Rage where we all come together, and you know, it's like the. Avenger. It's like the national or the the national team. We go and play on our club teams, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> and then the national team comes together. It's like the World Cup. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. 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 Yeah. When the and, stakes are highest. I mean, how does it differ to kind of performing with Rage back in the day? Obviously, it's been a while since yeah, you did yeah, that. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, there's nothing like you know Rage Against the Machine is a live experience and the. The, the the energy and the connection with an audience is something like I've never seen before in any show I've been to or been on been on stage. Um, but each of the different different entities that I've met, like one standing on stage next to Chris Cornell and hearing his incredible, you know, the the both the beauty and the fury of his voice uh, is like is otherworldly. Playing those Night Watchman shows where there's a, an intimate and deep connection and really feeling more than any other you know, um, artistic endeavor I've been involved in of being heard uh, and is a connection that is priceless. The um, Prophets of Rage stuff is so much fun to be in this super group isn't the right, but be, to being like this sort of, it's like the Avengers, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it's this kind of cast of superheroes and, um, you know, and drawing from all of those catalogs and just seeing audiences go absolutely ape shit around the globe to this Atlas Underground uh, record where it's, it, it feels to me like there's, I like doing stuff that doesn't feel safe, and this is not safe. I don't, I don't know, you know, exactly when, when I went to, to make this record, I let, let go of a lot of my controlling, type A controlling behavior, and just kind of let, like, let's figure it out. When, th when Wu-Tang thinks it's great, and I think it's great, then that song's done. You know, yeah. when Marcus thinks it's great, him, and sort of let that unfold. Um, and you know, this is a this is a record that has a lot of. It's not just music; it has a lot of ideas in it. There's you know, dance music is not one that is often infused with a tremendous amount of. Um, uh, it, it, you don't expect there to be sort of nuanced ideas in it, and we've got a lot of nuanced ideas on this record. On the subject of rage, mm -hmm. again, would do you ever see like a another kind of reunion happening do you think if there is a rage reunion count me in yeah <laughs> are you still are you still in contact with zach yeah yeah like we're all through, in contact yeah. yeah yeah and we're all friends and in contact speaking of rage shows one one that's kind of i guess iconic is the the dnc show sure and that which was obviously kind of re-released earlier this year yep, yep. for record store day i mean mm. do you still see like music music shows music events drawing in crowds like that do you still think they can be that bigger political statement. Yeah. Well, I mean, they can certainly be that big a political statement, even if they're in uh, uh, venues not of that size. You know, um, we're going to have a show tonight that's going to be in a, in a much smaller venue, which will hopefully be an impactful political statement as well. You know, uh, so the, you know, the idea is, is like I said, uh, like, 
when we when we kick this off, like I didn't really, ch I'm stuck being a guitar player, and so that is my uh, my weapon of choice. And wherever I play it, uh, it will be, yeah, you know, let the you know with hopefully with. Um, Authenticity is what you know the, the North Star that guides every every chord and every note and an uncompromising way of looking at both music and the world that uh, hopefully translates in whatever size venue. A lot of kind of I guess political conversation, especially in culture circles, has sort of moved towards more sort of politics of the South recently. There's a lot of talk mm. about you know Black Lives Matter, sure. LGBT sure. rights, sure. mental health is another sure. one that we kind of touched on. Sure. I mean, do you think that 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 can inspire bigger change. Those kind of that kind of more local, personal yeah, outlook. Ab absolutely, and I, I think that there's no there's no reason to ghettoize it and say that it has to be this change or that change. And all of the the things that you just mentioned are are uh, eminently worthwhile in pursuing those rights. Um, and you know, hopefully, in the pursuit of those rights, we can we can find an overarching solidarity to confront the you know the huge issues confronting our pl the planet. And do you think music is still, and um, will always remain, kind of a very core part of that? that yeah, well, it does movement? on this record, and it does. It will at tonight's show. You know, yeah. as I can be, beyond. I, that's what I have control over. You know, that's what I have control over. And you know, in order to be able to look myself in the mirror, I've got to. I have to know that my convictions are at the forefront of what it is I, that I do on a daily basis. And so, beyond that, I can't speak for other artists. And I, you know. I'm not like trying to get other artists who are non-political to become political because I think they should be. Um, how horrible would that be? <laughs> uh, but uh, but all I can do is speak for myself. And this is it, like I've been on a mission since I was 17 years old. I first picked up a guitar, became politi politicized at the same time, um, and that mission infuses every interview I do and every uh, song that I write and every chord that I play and every stage that I step on. Just to kind of conclude, there's obviously so much going on at the moment that seems quite dark. Mm -hmm. I mean. How do you kind of stay hopeful, I suppose? Yeah, um, well, there, there are two constants. One is injustice, and that makes things feel dark. The other constant is resistance to injustice, and that never goes away. And uh, I am constantly inspired by the people I run into on a daily basis, whether it's you know at a show or at the grocery store, who come up and they talk about how perhaps you know elements of art that I've been involved in has influenced them in some way and it really encourages me to never let up you know like the most obscure folk record I made you know it has touched someone in a way that has caused them to become either a public defender or to th or to put on a black mask and throw a Molotov you know and for me that's a good day at the office yeah for sure well that's great man that's everything right on, right so, on. okay thank, thank you very you so much. much cheers